Um, well, Anita's already given me, given you the, uh, the title of my talk. So without further ado, as I say, I will plunge into the images. But while you're looking at this work by the first artist I'm going to be discussing today, I'd like to say a few words by way of introduction to provide a kind of broader context about the very nature, the kind of intrinsic properties of the photographic medium. Starting, I mean, this is, this is, I think for many of you will be fairly familiar territory, but I think it's nevertheless worth reiterating. Among the major sort of uh, spokesmen for this are, as you probably know, Susan Zontag, Roland Barthes, and I shall quote both of them very briefly by way of preamble. Essentially what I'm getting at then is sort of the acknowledgement on the part of many commentators of the intimate connection between the photograph and death, the photograph and mortality. So, for example, Susan Zontag, talking um, in her very seminal text on photography of 1977, said the following. She said, all photographs are memento mori. To take a photograph is to participate in another person's or thing's mortality, vulnerability, mutability. Precisely by slicing out this moment and freezing it, all photographs testify to time's relentless melt. And in a very similar vein, Roland Barthes, in his equally influential Camera Lucida, Reflections on Photography of 1980, wrote as follows about a photograph of his mother. What pricks me is the, is the discovery of this equivalence. In front of the photograph of my mother as a child, I tell myself she's going to die. I shudder. I shudder over a catastrophe that has already occurred. Whether or not the subject is already dead, every photograph is this catastrophe. And I'd also like to add to the mix uh, a pithy, I think, insightful quotation by somebody, well, somebody I'd heard of, obviously before Diane Arbus, the famous uh, and disturbing American Jewish photographer, but something she uh, said about the very nature, again, of photography. A picture, a photograph, is a secret about a secret. The more it tells you, the less you know. And I'd like you to bear all three, I think, really insightful quotations in mind as, as we go along. Right, so as I think you can see from this first work on the screen by Arden Halter, who I'll talk about in more detail very shortly, the photographs I'm going to be looking at for the most part in this presentation are absolutely not atrocity photographs. They're not photographs of the Holocaust. They are, most of the works I'm going to be scrutinizing are works <sighs> prompted by, if that's the word, the urge to get close to family members who are no more. In other words, it's the family photograph that is the pivotal sort of subject here. Um, as the ever-present Marianne Hirsch has said, these family photographs from a innocent, if you like, in inverted commas, innocent pre-war period are relevant or are related to the Holocaust, not by their content, but by their context. And I think that's a useful, useful thing to keep in mind as well. They are small, they are few in number, often discovered after a family uh, member's death. Black and white, I think that's also important. Grainy, inaccessible in certain important respects. And if I could just carry on with one last quotation before we cut to the chase with the images um, from Marianne Hirsch herself, from uh, a seminal, again, a seminal text that has been mentioned more than once already yesterday, as I recall, uh, Family Frames of 1997. This is what she had to say, and I think I quoted it in my abstract for this talk. She said the following, Photographs in their enduring umbilical connection to life are precisely the medium collecting first, connecting first and second generation remembrance, memory and post memory. They are the leftovers, the fragmentary sources and building blocks shot through with holes, the work of post memory. And in the same text, she said elsewhere, photography's relation to loss and death is to bring the past back in the form of a ghostly revenant emphasizing at the very same time, it's immutable and irreversible pastness and irretrievability. So there she is anchoring those more general statements about photography in sort of post-memory, the sort of second generation uh, context. So Arden Walter, many of you will have come across him before. He's a fine artist in his own right. He's also, with all the uh, complications that he entails, he's the son of the Holocaust survivor artist, Roman Walter. Uh, I could say a lot more about all the artists, but I must be very careful not to run over. So I'll focus on a series he did. I think to my knowledge, actually the first artist based in this country, although he also divides his time uh, between Israel and, and, and England, um, but the first artist 
more or less based in this country that I'm aware of, who already in the 1980s is actually not only focusing on the kind of the, 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 the need to come to grips with these fam, you know, family photographs, but also to actually engage with the whole, or engage creatively with the whole concept of being a second, a member of the second generation. I will mention also, en passant, but relevantly, that he has written a very painfully honest, I think quite searingly honest, uh, memoir, a, a book called The Fire and the Bonfire, which will be published next, oh, I hope at the end of this year, by a new venture called Second Generation Publishing. Right, so the series was prompted, as I've already indicated, by just six small, tantalizing, frustratingly flat, as he himself said, flat photographs of his pre-war Polish Jewish family. He called them frustratingly flat, that's the term he used himself. And he actually said, and I <coughs> quote from that uh, autobiography I mentioned, his relatives, my relatives live in the same way as still life. I could come no closer to them than to these photographs. So what does he do? He approaches the subject in various interrelated ways and I'll just show you um, one or two or three examples from the series. This one as you can see is a relatively straightforward, I think almost deliberately kind of impassive, ineloquent, but eloquent, you know, eloquent in its inability to be eloquent, um, transposition of one of these rather formal, smartly dressed, you know, family photographs that we're I think quite familiar with. But he goes further. And he alternates between the more straightforward approach and the more interventionist one. As you can see here, another family photograph is a hemmed in, as it were, um, juxtaposed within that kind of aggressive, almost dagger-like uh, Gothic lettering around it by uh, Nazi sort of anti-Semitic slogans, counterbalanced, if that's the word, with the kind of softer Hebrew script, which actually gives the details of the names and birth and well, death dates of these unknown to Arden, unknown family members. And this one I find perhaps particularly poignant, I don't know whether you'd agree with me, where the increasingly fuzzy, you know, the kind of blurred features of these family members are attacked by, submerged by the, again, the Gothic lettering so beloved of the Nazis, fremd, as, as German speakers among you will well know, but it means hard to translate actually exactly into English, but stranger, alien, foreigner. And uh, I'll just read to you, if I may, just briefly what he himself said about this kind of strategy that he's chosen to employ. He said in several of the paintings from the series, The Family I Never Knew, which is the collective title for the series, I employed lettering slogans that are suspended like a veil between me and the viewer and the subject. These formal devices indicate distance, an abyss I cannot cross, do not wish to cross, the limits to my experience, the distinction between knowledge and inherited knowledge. So in a way, he's absolutely, you know, firsthand corroborating the more general statement made, uh, I quoted earlier from Marianne Hirsch. Moving on to my second artist here, um, Yorkshire-based Judith Tucker. And I think all, you know, these photographs will be in principle, all very familiar to us, I, I, I think. Um, family, apparently carefree holiday pictures, very different, in fact, to the more formal uh, imagery that we've just uh, been seeing Arden grappling with. But uh, these are photographs, again, small in number, small in scale, that Judith Tucker discovered in her maternal grandmother's album. But they could stand, I think, for many others. And um, she, too, has spoken, written eloquently, of the poignancy of such photographs. And at the risk of over quoting, quoting I will, uh, if I may cite from her own words, she said as, as follows, she said, I find the combination of carefree leisure and suggestions of death inherent in the deferred viewing of these holiday photographs powerful. People often smile um, in holiday photos, perhaps sending good memories into the unknown future. This becomes all the more poignant when we know with hindsight what that future was. Now, Judith takes a different strategy. She decides in the early 2000s to pay a visit to the resort on the Baltic coast, just north of Berlin, where these family photographs were taken. And these are photographs, as you can see, taken by Judith herself on one such trip. And at first, she wasn't quite sure what to do with what she was confronting. But as you can see, one rather visually striking feature of this flat Baltic seascape 
are the so-called Strandkorbe. The Strandkorbe is a kind of beach basket, this curious, you can see it here, most notably on the bottom left of your screen, somewhere between, well, what are they exactly? A deck chair, a kind of enclosure, indicative perhaps of shelter and protection, but of course, actually, again, with the power of hindsight, we know that they, that is totally illusory. But in any event, she was struck as an artist, as a visual artist, by the striking forms of these beach baskets, so typical of the Baltic coast. And what does she do? She transcribes in a deliberately blurred and indeed a monochrome fashion, aping the monochrome nature of those family album photographs. She transcribes some of those um, photographs into drawings done on a very large scale. Um, if you look at installation shots of, of this series, which she calls cryptically and I think quite tellingly resort, they are much, much larger. They're almost quite you know, quite monumental compared with the, the, the tiny kind of elusive intimacy of the original inspiration. And put in mind, I have to say, looking at these, uh, of Gerhard Richter's similar strategy of blurring apparently anonymous, but actually personally very significant photographs that he already, you know, he became famous for in the 1960s, and maybe that's something we could pick up on. Uh, just very briefly, here are three paintings which obviously follow on, you know, a kind of natural sort of corollary of those uh, drawings that I just showed you. And also she did a number of paintings and also indeed drawings where there are no people. These are unpeopled images focusing entirely on the Frankov itself. And I would put you, I mean, I'll, I'll give you quite frankly my personal response that in some ways I find the absence of bodies, the absence of the human presence, yes, um, in works such as this even more poignant, even more telling than the ones that contain people. And I, I'll leave that perhaps again as a subject for further discussion. Julia Winkler, they, uh, based in Brighton, is an academic, in fact, like, like Judith Tucker, an academic as well as a practitioner. Uh, she, unlike the two artists I've just um, mentioned, is has a less um, a direct and less sort of um, obvious connection to the Jewish past. It's actually only one family member, her um, great uncle by marriage, Hugo Hecker, as he was called, who is the Jew in the family, as it were. But this has preoccupied her immensely. Um, basically, the story is here that she inherited um, a house on the south coast of England from her uh, great aunt, Martha. And in the attic, she finds Hugo's suitcase. And this is, as you can see, is apparently, you know, deadpan, but of course, very, very telling photograph of the suitcase in question. And as well as that, elsewhere in the house, she finds two, again, small, tiny, frustratingly mute, if you like, photographs of family members. And she says, again, I could quote extensively, I mustn't do so, but she uh, states her absolute determination to break through the silence, to break through the lack of knowledge, to somehow come to terms with it, to bring this history back into the light. And what she proceeds to do, and uh, the work, the collective work, as you saw, was called Traces, she incorporates often fragments, you can see on the top right here, from those two newly discovered family photographs from her great uncle's past um, with documentary sort of details. And as you can see in the bottom two thirds of this slide, photographs that she herself took on a visit made soon after to Krakow, to in fact the village where Hugo had come from and to areas both of personal and also wider Jewish significance in Southern Poland. And going back, I think to David Clark's talk yesterday, this kind of urge to revisit, yes, the sites of family history in the present is of course a very, very loaded and problematic one, which again, hopefully we can revisit. Sarah, Sarah Davenman is, is an interesting artist and I'd like to spend a little time um, looking uh, at her if I may, I realize I'm going to very rapidly run out of time here. Um, her first encounter, her first encounter with her partly Jewish history was when she discovered in the house vacated by her elderly mother when she had to go into a nursing home uh, was dozens and dozens of diaries, notebooks, penned by her mother and hidden away. And what she proceeded to do in 2011 was to take these, again, apparently deadpan photographs of what she found, which told an immensely poignant and to her sort of illuminating, revelatory story of her mother, her non-Jewish mother's attempts to somehow make her Jewish 
German Jewish father's life somehow more, more bearable. He had come as a kinder transport child. More interestingly, I think much more recently, and this work's going to be the subject of an exhibition at the Four Corners Gallery, hopefully later this year, chemigrams. Chemigrams are an extraordinarily um, uh, kind of complex and sophisticated sort of manipulating of the photographic medium. So we're talking about something very different here. But as you can see in looking for Leo, Leo was her, an uncle who she very much liked the look of from the, again, the holiday photographs taken pre-war, but she manipulates, she uses darkroom chemicals, she uses her own blood even, photographic bleach and actually incising and scraping of the drawing uh, and drawing on the surface to produce a work which is elusive, haunting and ever evasive, if you like. She does the same with other photographs found in family albums once more of a children's party. The poignancy of that really doesn't need commenting on. Rather differently, and I find her work particularly interesting, I'll be honest, because she does things in unexpected, less predictable sorts of ways. She discovered among her mother's possessions a plait of her own hair, her name Sarah, obviously with its loaded Jewish resonance, cut off and kept when Sarah, the artist, was only five years old. And basically she takes photograms of the process of unraveling, literally unplatting, if you like, almost, the strand, the, the plat it's itself, and these are just two from that series. And even more uh, unusual and, and certainly visually striking are a series of photographs she took under the microscope of the blood of members of her own Mischling family, which of course has its own very, very sinister and loaded associations. Uh, very, very briefly, Lona Brunstein, the daughter of two Holocaust survivors, again, quite recently, this is a subject that simply doesn't go away, a kind of preoccupation, an installation that was based um, or prompted by a visit that she and her daughter took just shortly after the artist's mother's death to Auschwitz itself. It incorporates a whole uh, array of different media, but what I wanted to stress is it includes still photographs, not only of her grandmother, her mother, herself, but also her daughter, so it's four generations of women. And of course, gender is something that we keep touching on, but I would like to think that we can talk about it in more detail later on. Uh, also, uh, a photograph of a different kind incorporated into that installation. Uh, she went with a group called Unite Against Fascism, and I think picking up on the discussion at the end of yesterday, the kind of left-wing anti-fascist kind of uh, determination of many of the artists is certainly noteworthy. and. What this is, it shows her holding the soil taken from the soles of the shoes of her fellow members of the Unite Against Fascism group. And lastly, Monica Petzl, who takes a somewhat different tack. Um, this is from a very, very ambitious, in fact, large series of essentially photo montages that were displayed at Leicester Museum and Art Gallery just before COVID kicked in and sadly, of course, had to be curtailed. But it's, there's, there's a lot on her own website, uh, which will tell you more if you're interested. Um, borrowing technique, I think, taken well from the likes of John Hartfield um, way back in the 1920s. Uh, she, as you can see here, and these are just two of the series, she incorporates photographs taken from her own family past with interventions that on the left there that you know provide a broader context of anti-semitic uh, discrimination and persecution in the 1930s and then actually comes right up to the present but linking past and present I think in deliberately kind of thought-provoking and and almost challenging sorts of ways as you can see here there's the photograph of the slightly cheesy kinder transport memorial at Liverpool Street station but juxtaposed on the top right with a photograph of herself as a child the kind of heir to her family's legacy to Enoch Powell to the Windrush generation to the need to stand up against racism in the present. I'll leave it there, but I hope that my brief presentation has opened up lots of extra avenues for discussion and inquiry. Thank you very much. My focus today is on an exhibition entitled Staircase, which was created by three generations of Holocaust survivors and first shown as part of the Brighton Jewish Film Festival in 2000, comprising a multimedia installation and a text-based performance slash play. At its heart is the light motif of a communal stairwell in a block of Viennese flats, against which a non-linear narrative unfolds through the eyes of a young girl, 
an adult woman and a grandmother. In combining the creativity of three artists, three women artists from three generations of the same family, Staircase reveals how the shadow of the Holocaust, experiences of exile, separation and loss, and complexities born from conflicting identities continue to resonate across the decades. So the three artists are Helga Mickey, born in Vienna in 1921, a kinder transportee whose graphic work developed in exile in post-war Britain. Her daughter, expressionist painter Ruth Ricks, born in 1942 in Leamington Spa, as she says, in the very middle of England to Austrian emigre parents. And Ruth's English daughter, interdisciplinary artist Rebecca Swift, born in 1963, who trained at Dartington College. And Dartington itself has a particular resonance as a progressive educational institution that gave refuge to many Hitler emigres. But I will begin with Helga's biography as it underpins and overarches every aspect of Staircase. Not only was Helga the mother and grandmother of two of the principal artists, but her memories provided the inspiration for much of the written text. Helga also physically voiced recordings of the grandmother in the play, Photographs of her formed part of the installation, while her framed prints were shown in the gallery. Present in so many guises, Helga was the one for whom the tragedy of the Holocaust and the trauma of displacement was a reality, not just an anecdote. I had first become aware of Helga soon after her death in September 2018 via the bilingual monograph, I am beginning to want what I am which introduced her life story and her largely hitherto unknown oeuvre in a compendium rich with literary contributions. This approach was particularly apt, given that Helga was the identical twin of Ilse Eichinger, one of Austria's foremost post-war writers, known for her Holocaust novel, Die Große Hoffnung, published in 1948. The twins were born on the 1st of November, 1921, to Berta Niekremer, a Jewish pediatrician who converted, and her Catholic teacher husband, Ludwig Eichinger, and were baptized as Catholics. Following their parents' divorce, the twins remained with Bertha. Helga left school before final exams with no firm career plan. Art was certainly not considered at this stage. Following the Anschluss, the family could only arrange the escape of one Mischlinger half-Jew twin. Thus Helga left Vienna, one of the last kinder transport on 4th July 1939 to join her aunt Clara Kramer in London where she was working as a domestic while Ilsa remained and you can see on the family tree we're looking at the right hand link right hand wing where we have Helga, Ruth and Rebecca. Both Ilsa and Berta survived the war though close family members including the twins maternal grandmother Gisela and two of her children, Erna and Felix, were deported to Minsk in 1942 and murdered. The twins remained separated until 1947, when Ilse finally visited England. Of her own arrival, Helga recalled, quote, It was a very foreign country, and it wasn't as if I had come as an au pair or a student or for a job. I came as a refugee, and refugees are never received as guests, always with a little bit of condescension, end quote. Fortunately, she was welcomed by the Austrian exile community and swiftly absorbed into the dynamic cultural milieu of the refugee organization, the Austrian Center, and its youth section, Young Austria. Here she met her husband, Jewish emigre, Walter Singer, whom she married in 1941. Their daughter, Ruth, was born the following year. And although the couple divorced in 1948, with Walter returning to Vienna, they remained in contact. Through the Austrian center, Helga was introduced to many notable emigres, including sculptor Anna Mahler, to whom she sat, and writer Elias Canetti, who with his wife Weser would occasionally babysit Ruth. As with many emigre women, Helga was employed doing piecework. She also worked at Bimini Buttons, which employed Lucy Ree. She worked as a waitress and a secretary, but with her striking looks, also had bit parts in several films, including The Third Man, itself set in Vienna. She also translated German into English, including some of Ilse's texts. Encouraged by her twin to write poetry, 
as a creative outlet, Helga gradually drifted towards the visual arts. Her first painted experiments beginning in the early 1960s, soon after the end of her short-lived second marriage to former Bletchley codebreaker, Donald Mickey. These bright, naive works were followed by a sudden and energetic outpouring of drawings, often in Byron, initially to entertain her grandchildren, Becky and Datlin, in Yorkshire in the late 1960s, often populated by dark, troubled imagery, alluding to conflict, separation, journeys, refuge and home. Her art further developed through friendship with German emigre writer H.G. Adler and his artist wife Bettina. And during the 1970s and 80s, Helga started printmaking at the City Lit and Morley College in London. Although her art remained largely private, she had several shows in the UK and Germany, mostly in the late 1980s, while the monograph has inevitably led to a rekindling of interest in her work. In early 2020, Benuri acquired her etching headland on the screen on the right, her first work to enter a UK public collection. I'll now return to Staircase. In 2000, Jenny Sharpstone from the fourth Brighton Jewish Film Festival, now the Jewish Film Festival, discussed with Becky the possibility of commissioning a work inspired by the Kinder Transport, which would go beyond film to bring the festival into a range of other spaces. Becky thus brought Helga and Ruth to the project, and Staircase began to grow organically and collaboratively into its two constituent parts. The text-based play slash performance, you have an extract on the left, and the multimedia installation on the right, which combined film, recorded, recorded text, lighting, sound, artwork, printed extracts from the play, and family photographs, all seemingly casually located within a shed-like structure created by Ruth, with Helga's prints on the gallery walls beyond. All these disparate elements coalesce to dramatize Helga's recollections. She was by then 79, whilst deliberately blurring the boundaries between reality and fiction. The characters in the play were presented as fictional archetypes, despite drawing on real life experiences of Helga, Ruth and Becky. Helga was the grandmother retelling her own stories, such as an actual visit by Joseph Mengele, whom we know from later terrible events had a research interest in twins, the arrival of a Red Cross letter with devastating news, the deportation of an aunt. Furthermore, although creativity was the shared signifier between grandmother, mother and daughter, the Brighton Flyer did not explicitly acknowledge that the three main artists were in fact three generations of one family. This was further obfuscated by three different surnames, Mickey, Ricks, Swift, a factor that often complicates narratives of female emigres who can easily vanish from history with a name change, or conversely can seem to be confusingly multiplied. There are in fact three Helgas, Helga Eichinger, Helga Singer, Helga Mickey. Becky was the ringmaster for Staircase its catalyst, facilitator, curator, director, writer for the initial pitch, the funding bid, and the play itself, creating the central staircase concept, who then discovered to her surprise that both her mother and grandmother had explored the same imagery in their own works. Helga in prints such as Where the House Had Been and Concord, while Ruth used the motif in an important painting entitled Staircase, from 2000, inspired by glimpsing an open stairwell in a ruined yeshiva in old Tel Aviv, combined with childhood memories of playing on the stairs of a London rooming house and post-war visiting Berta's flat in a devastated Vienna. Becky has reflected on the strong bonds and experiences shared between three generations of survivor women who all grew up with often absent or part present fathers and which generally made collaboration an easier prospect, a quote. The intergenerational aspect is an interesting question. Maybe it does exist in other families, but takes different, sometimes less tangible forms. What is interesting in our family is that everyone's an artist across all the generations. We all tuned into the same field in the way that artists are often sensitive to things just below the surface. 
end quote. Granddaughter and grandmother had a further degree of empathy and communication, perhaps helped by the fact that they were separated by a generation. The mother and daughter relationship, in contrast, was perhaps too close and marked by a period of estrangement. Becky and Helga corresponded throughout the project, bouncing off each other all the time. Helga was a natural drama queen, as befits someone in The Third Man, an amazing storyteller who, quote, loved the intimacy of sharing stories together over the tea, of being recorded, who would create on the hoof through conversation very spontaneously, end quote. Becky's recordings of Helga's voice filled the gallery, her rich continental tones commanding, but also at times hesitant. She would hover over words, not through ignorance, but because of a sophisticated understanding of the subtleties of language. She was, after all, a translator, and she would have performed, but was in a wheelchair by then. Twelve of her framed prints, selected by Ruth, including the Blue Rider and the Square, were displayed in the gallery. Ruth's role, in contrast, in Staircase, was as artist constructor, creating the Hessian-covered structure at its heart, incorporating her oil staircase, a collage of the same name, which included images of the Tel Aviv stairwell and of a young Becky, it's the image in the middle on the screen, plus a sketch, Stairwoman, a surreal everywoman whose body recalls a Dali-esque open chest of drawers. Oils are Ruth's preferred medium, though she also draws, and her work is broadly influenced by Central European culture. She was aware from early on that she was the child of a Holocaust survivor, but this does not often manifest itself explicitly in her work. However, her creativity and independence were very much bound up with her formative experiences, her unsettled home life and her position in the wider world early on, oscillating between England and Austria. As a young child, she attended Anna Freud's nursery and a kindergarten in Oxford, where she remembers being given paints to occupy herself after an accident. She was then sent briefly to a very English boarding school on Helga's fees from the third man. Ruth also recalls her mother only speaking to her in English, thus Helga with her Austrian history and her link to Ilse in Vienna provided a doorway into Austria and Ruth conversely for her mother won into Englishness, though quote, we both strayed constantly into each other's worlds, end quote. Was Ruth Austrian or British or both? As she says with a smile, she had, quote, a foot in both camps and a twin in both countries, end quote. She carries this notion of duality and fracture with her, while a split in identity also marked her formal art studies. Ruth studied art in London from 1956 to 63, including at the Central School, where she was influenced by émigré theatre designer Ralph Coltai and at Leeds Polytechnic from 68 to 71, where Willy Thier, a refugee from Berlin, was an important shooter, leading her to think more about her Jewishness, I quote. When I was a child, it felt dangerous to let people know I was Jewish, and my mother also tended to hide it, depending on who she was with. My father was totally Jewish, and I became more aware during my time in Vienna, end quote. Ruth studied in Vienna from 1972 to four, with renowned Austrian sculptor, Fritz Vertruber. She was a painter sent to sculpture school, once again straying into two worlds. Helga knew Vertruber through Canetti and Anna, Anna Mahler, and Ruth recalls, quote, the twins talked a lot about their childhood. Vienna seemed the natural place to go and study. My father and his second family lived there, and I'd only rediscovered them a few years before, end quote. Becky went to school there, gradually waking, awakening her own Austrian connection, and the third generation remained strongly drawn to the city. Vienna thus became the powerful locus, which links all three artists and is at the core of Staircase, by dint of family history and by the continuing lure of its culture, a city of sensuous art and the birthplace of psychoanalysis. Helga recalled watching Freud in his Hampstead back garden from her Red Cross bedsit on Fitzjohn's Avenue, while Burton knew Austrian psychoanalyst Alfred Adler. Viennese stairways form the central images of staircase, both written and visual, sometimes sharply in focus, sometimes veiled. They are winding trajectories which bind together memories held by each of the three women. 
For Becky, they are, quote, betwixt and between spaces where you glimpse the lives of others without them knowing. A marginal space, a liminal space, as well as the nexus where everything interconnects. Flat doors open or remain shut and withhold secrets and people, end quote. Becky vividly recalls their distinctive sound and smell, the feel of the banisters and the look of the decorative ironwork, even in the most ordinary flats. Furthermore, and I quote, from my own nine-year-old perspective, they were full of something unspoken. I projected onto them a sense that something was suppressed, both in the history of the city and within myself and my family, end quote. For Ruth, the motif resonated with her own memories of Berta's flat in post-war Vienna and of sitting on the stairs outside Clara's bedsit at 128 Goldhurst Terrace, West Hampstead, which she shared for several years while at school and where stairs became her playground. Refugees in London often lived in single rooms in tall multi-occupancy houses. And Becky now, with perfect circularity, lives round the corner. Clara is also represented in staircase in fragments of photos. We can see the image on the right, particularly a photograph of her sitting with Becky in a London park, evoking memories of Berta and Ilsa sitting together in Vienna's Jewish cemetery, visiting the grave of their grandfather Jakob when Nazi laws forbade Jews from visiting the Vienna woods. Becky describes Clara as another strong woman, a gifted linguist and musician, Adored family photographer, a further link between, oh, right. between England and Austria. Quote, a big inspiration. And so you could say four generations informed the work. If I were to rewrite it, she would feature more. And it's in keeping with the fact that I now live near where she used to live. Always there, steady, giving sensible advice. End quote. Clara's tiny bedsit was also a store for the last family things from Austria. Bits of crochet and china were on display, and a few new clothes for Gisela hung in the wardrobe. Hoping that the family would be re reunited, Clara made a warm continental heim where objects were powerful repositories of memories and family stories. Ruth, now the family archivist, has a responsibility that goes with guardianship, and Becky recognises how hard it is for her to throw away family photos and yet how she, how she must, as they are, quote, clogging up the house, end quote. Rachel, Rachel we have yep. to, I think we'll start winding up. Yeah, I've literally two paragraphs. Um, uh, Becky acknowledges that Ruth looks after things carefully. She is literally a caretaker, while Helga was the opposite. She didn't take care of things. She had the energy of distraction, which led to a role reversal. The daughter became the mother. Clara also fulfilled a maternal role. Small rituals such as afternoon tea assumed an importance and a source of stability for the family, in contrast to the feeling of rootlessness which Helga projected. As she said, my entire life has stayed makeshift. I never wanted to do anything for the long term because your long term is going to end up destroyed, end quote. Just to conclude, there is a resonance between Helga's observation and the shifting transitory nature of staircase itself. So I would like to end with a comment on its future. Although two decades old, the project still retains the power to be relevant today, hovering somewhere between a deeply ingrained personal history and a dark half remembered continental fable. Envisaged not as static or fixed, Becky sees its potential for reinvention and I quote, the piece emerged at a particular time. Since then, much has changed in the world and as a family, we have all grown. A new generation has been born and my grandmother and her sister have died. Whilst the work of their auntie Erna, my great, great aunt, a pianist, has become known and celebrated in Vienna. So it would probably need to be reconfigured to speak to who we are today in today's world, end quote. The staircase, this unique creation of three generations of survivors was and can still be a potent and distinctive vessel to convey the wider narrative of the Holocaust through personal intergenerational stories now and into the future. Thank you for your attention.